and uh, thank you for doing me the very great honor of asking me to speak at this uh, webinar. I must say I find it a bit uh, frightening because all of those people to whom I'm speaking uh, know far more about this topic than do I. And uh, therefore, it's, uh, if I get it all wrong, you'll all know about it. But then I guess as a, as a, as a member of parliament, uh, you get used to most people knowing more things than you do. And uh, maybe I can stimulate some thought and discussion in the, in the webinar. Um, I'm only sorry I can't stay for the whole webinar because I have to be back in Parliament. Uh, but um, I know that I'll be seeing the uh, outcome from it in, in, in the paper format, uh, and we'll look forward to reading your conclusions. Uh, but I'm just sorry I can't personally be here. But I'm absolutely delighted that India is taking such a keen interest in the two polar oceans. I do remember visiting the Indian um, research station at Nyalasund in the very far north of Svalbard uh, twice now, I think. Uh, and of course, uh, India has a huge interest in uh, activity in the polar oceans. Not only does it affect the weather, and of course could have a very real, real effect on the monsoon, which was such a key importance to India. Uh, the melting of the glaciers in the Himalayas uh, has a huge effect also, I suspect, on river levels and in other ways. And of course, sea levels could be catastrophic uh, for certain of the low-lying coastal areas of the, of the whole of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, including Bangladesh, I think, we're particularly badly affected by the increase in the oceans that some of us uh, fear uh, may be just about to occur. So I welcome this uh, webinar. It comes to a very good time indeed. Now, I don't need to lecture you on how important the polar oceans uh, are. Um, they cover only 20% of the world's uh, oceans, but they soak up 75% of the total heat produced uh, by the world. 75% so of the heat produced goes into the polar oceans, only 20% of the coverage. Of the CO2, the carbon dioxide which we produce in the world, 40% of it alone goes into the Southern Ocean, goes into the Antarctic Ocean, Southern Ocean alone, uh, leaving aside the other uh, oceans. And uh, the uh, polar oceans are, are a marine heat sink. Uh, they, 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 they've soaked up 90% of all of the CO2 we produced uh, since the uh, Industrial Revolution began right back at the beginning of the 19th uh, century. So they're absolutely essential from the point of view of the weather and from the point of view of the uh, global environment. But they also provide a massive quantity of food for a hungry world. The, the Arctic alone produces 7 million tons of fish a year. That's 7%, that's 10% rather, of the total global fish catch. catch. 7 million tons alone from the Arctic, and of course, there's plenty uh, from the Antarctic and the Southern Ocean uh, as well. And not only that, but they sustain millions of seabirds, whales, fish, many of them threatened species. So they're an absolutely vital part uh, of the global uh, environment. But the purpose in this webinar, and the reason why you're all looking into it, is because we know what a great threat there is to. Uh, both the Arctic and the Antarctic. I'll perhaps focus a little bit more on the Antarctic uh, today being the Southern Hemisphere. Now, Antarctica not only suffers from the worst consequences of climate change, but it also creates it and amp amplifies it. It's quite interesting to think that the IPCC targets in, in Paris uh, did not include the Antarctic ice sheet at all. It didn't consider the consequences of the Antarctic ice sheet uh, melting. So the 40 centimeter sea level rise which Paris sought to combat would be added to another 40 centimeters uh, if you were to include Antarctica. Now what that means is that if the Antarctic ice sheet were to disappear, and of course we're not talking about immediately, but over the next century there's a reasonable chance the large part of it might do that. If the Antarctic ice sheet were to disappear, we're talking about two meters of global sea level rise by the year 2100 with Antarctica contributing 50% uh, of that. Amazing to think that Antarctica's ice sheet contains 70% of the world's fresh water. Quite extraordinary, 70% of the world's fresh water is in Antarctica alone. And of course, we know uh, that they are showing signs of melting and, and, and dropping into the uh, ocean at an absolutely alarming rate. An iceberg the size of Manhattan, an iceberg the size of Manhattan broke off from Thwaites uh, a couple of years back. 
Uh, and if the whole Thwaites Glacier were to collapse, which uh, we're, we're monitoring very closely, but of course it's at least possible, that would account for a 12 feet rise uh, in ocean levels, which is just uh, horrendous to think about it. And the Western Antarctic Ice Sheet is one of the most dramatic pieces of evidence of climate change. There really is some very dramatic things happening there, and we must do something about it. Now, of course, leaving aside climate change, there are other less dramatic threats to the both the Arctic and the Antarctic, uh, which we've got to do something about. The polar oceans, as we will be hearing, I think, later in the webinar, do drive global ocean circulation, moving all those gases and those organic matters. They move them around the planet because of the circulation uh, of the of the of the currents. Um, the nutrients from the southern ocean sustain 75% of global ocean primary production. 75% of global production comes from nutrients which are swept up. Uh, from the Southern Ocean, yet the Antarctic krill, of which there are 400 trillion, 400 trillion Antarctic krill, uh, they are changing their behaviors. They're moving southwards. They're moving down towards the Antarctic continent as the uh, Atlantic Ocean uh, becomes warmer. And of course, that has a dramatic effect on fish stocks and biodiversity uh, in the it's like further north. Now, there are other things that are threats too that we have to do something about. There's the commercial activity, which I think we'll be hearing about later on in the, um, in, in the webinar. Um, uh, currently, uh, it appears there's quite a large possibility of, uh, of uh, commercial activity, certainly in the Arctic, and to a lesser degree uh, in the Arctic, in the Antarctic. Now, I'm one of those who's of the view that we should not seek to ban commercial activity lock, stock, and barrel. That'd be a crazy thing to do, and it would affect the livelihoods of Many millions of people, five million people live above the Arctic Circle line. Uh, so, in fact, the livelihoods of vast numbers of people, of course, the fishing industry would be decimated. We must not uh, have a, a, a total ban on commercial activity, but we must take urgent steps to make sure that we uh, control it. Uh, we're seeing, uh, particularly in the Arctic, uh, the, the ice is retreating and uh, oil and gas and minerals interests are taking an increasing interest, shipping interests, of course, too, through the, through the Northern Sea Route. Um, and um, something like 20% of all the world's undiscovered oil and gas is in the Arctic Ocean, 20%. And at the moment, it costs a great deal more, $60 a barrel. It's not worth drilling uh, in the Arctic right now. Uh, but of course, if the, if the oil price, global oil price increased, it may well become much more attractive. We've got to control the production of oil and gas and minerals, particularly in Greenland minerals. Uh, we've got to control the production of those minerals uh, in the Arctic. In the south, we need to be we're, we're, we're pleased that the protocol environmental protection protects the Southern Ocean to a very good degree. And of course, you can't have commercial mining uh, in Antarctica itself. It's not allowed under the treaty. Uh, but tourism has grown exponentially in recent, recent years. Right now, because of COVID, of course, it stopped. Uh, and the global banking crash in 2008 made it plateau out a bit. But nonetheless, the likelihood of there being a very sharp increase in tourism, both around the Antarctic coast uh, but also in, 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 into the mainland uh, is a really quite a large worry. Uh, and we must find ways of sustainably managing uh, the tourism in the south. Now, reducing carbon emissions is a matter for other conferences, and uh, most of the world is talking about it. I'm very glad they are. I shan't touch it myself for now because there are more important things to talk about. But of course, COP26 in Glasgow this year has a vitally important role to play in combating carbon and trying to avoid the worst consequences of, of, of the kind that we've been uh, discussing. But there are real and substantive things that we can do in the polar oceans ourselves uh, to combat these various threats. So, for example, uh, controlling the krill catch is vitally important. I mean, there are uh, cowboy uh, fishing in interests which would catch limitless quantities of krill. Uh, if they did, that's a real effect on the rest of the biodiversity in the Southern Ocean. So uh, CAMLA, the Convention, uh, the Convention for Conservation of the Antarctic Marine Living Resource, plays an absolutely vital role in controlling fisheries in the Southern Ocean uh, and up into the South Atlantic uh, as well. They also have done great work in producing um, uh, marine protection areas. Uh, absolutely vital if we're going to control uh, the uh, developments in the Southern Ocean. Uh, and two of them, of course, will be very successfully established around Antarctica. 
But the big prize is the Weddell Sea. We, we have got to get a, a, an MPA at the Weddell Sea. At the moment, Russia and China are blocking it uh, because of their commercial fishing interests. They mustn't be allowed to do so. We must find a way of getting the Weddell Sea and also East Antarctica. They must become marine protected areas as soon as we possibly can. And some pressure to bear must be brought to bear, I think, on both Russia and China uh, to do that. Another area where I'm afraid India has a, a great deal of work to be done, and, and, and China too, and much of, much of the Asia Pacific area, is the whole question of plastics. It's a huge threat. Every year we tip 5 million tons of plastic into the oceans, 5 million tons. Uh, much of it uh, going both the Arctic and the Antarctic, because of the way the ocean flows work, much of it lands up either the north or the south. And of course, that has been catastrophic. Uh, for wildlife and for biodiversity in both uh, oceans, both large plastic items, and we see all these films of uh, plastic spoons and earbuds and things being found in, 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 in uh, uh, birds' uh, crests. Um, and I pay tribute incidentally to David Attenborough, whose single uh, film uh, of uh, an albatross being cut, a baby albatross absolutely stuffed the gills with plastic. That has played a real role in changing people's attitude to plastic across the globe. But it's not only this big thing, it's also the microplastics. I was interested to see the other day in a Norwegian study that a single um, uh, uh, litre of melted Arctic sea ice, so take one, one litre of Arctic sea ice, contains 1,900 microplastic uh, fibres. 1,900 microplastic fibres in one litre of sea ice, simply uh, absolutely gigantic. And of course, the Seabirds and, and animals believe it's food, they ingest it, and it kills them. And we have to do much more about plastics, particularly plastic bags. We in the UK have been very successful uh, in bringing in a, 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 a price in the supermarket. You can't now get a plastic bag. We've, we've virtually done away with plastic bags. Nearly all bags are, are, are reusable, recyclable bags for life. But throughout much of the uh, Asia Pacific region, I've, I've seen it myself in many, many places. Plastic bags are an absolutely central part of life, and they seem to be everywhere. Uh, we've got to do far, far, far more about plastic bags, which are killing uh, our uh, wildlife. Now, these and so many more challenges uh, uh, are reasonably well managed in the south. The Arctic Council in the north really does hardly anything by comparison with the Antarctic Treaty. The Antarctic Treaty has done great work in its uh, uh, 60 years. Now we celebrate its 60th anniversary at the end of last year. Remarkable, only 14 articles in the Antarctic Treaty, 14 articles, but it has done fantastic work. And if you think about the fact that there has been not any warfare of any kind whatsoever in the Antarctic continent in that time, nor any military deployments, nor any uh, strife of any kind at all, the, the, the continent has been preserved for science and peace for 60 years, uh, thanks to the Antarctic Treaty. And I think that the rest of the world could learn an awful lot from the way that the Antarctic Treaty uh, system uh, works. That, together with uh, Kamlar, which I mentioned earlier on, Kamlar do great work. Uh, it needs to be strengthened. We need to persuade the world's uh, countries to combine and agree in Kamlar, particularly the Russians and the Chinese need to be brought rather more on board, if at all possible. And that was followed by uh, the Environmental Protection Protocol, um, which establishes Antarctica as a natural reserve. All of those things have worked extraordinarily well. And international agreements which we'll need to bring in to combat climate change, particularly in COP26, but elsewhere as well, they could take a great deal of lesson, learn many lessons from Antarctica, where the international cooperation has actually achieved such a vast uh, amount. We've got to control invasive species. I, I went down to South Georgia, lucky enough to go to South Georgia recently, a year or two ago, uh, to see the uh, after effects of the removal of the rats. Uh, uh, South Georgia had been entirely inf infested by rats, but we managed to entirely eradicate them and also reindeer as well. But if something like that would happen in, on the Antarctic continent, if, if, if one family of rats found their way onto the Antarctic continent, we'd be talking potential uh, catastrophe. And we really have to make sure that doesn't happen. We have to remain vigilant to make sure that we save the Antarctica from it. And that's why last year I, I convened in London the first ever. Um, Antarctic Parliamentarians Assembly. Uh, we got together 18 of the 54 Antarctic nations together in London, and we produced a hard-hitting report at the end of it, very strongly worded report, about preserving Antarctica for 
generations to come, very much welcomed by all 18. And I think the other 54 uh, Antarctic nations are looking at it very carefully, and I hope that we'll have a repeat uh, of the uh, of, of the conference in, in two years' time, or now one and a half years' time, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. And rather, rather hope we might find either New Zealand or Australia will be prepared to, to host it for us. But I think getting Antarctic parliamentarians together is very important because governments have their own interests. Governments want to do things. Governments want uh, develop. They want oil. They want they want all those things. Parliaments are driven by our people, and its parliaments can therefore uh, restrain governments. And therefore, getting parliamentarians together in the in the way that we did last year, and I hope to every two years, I think is terribly important to try and save uh, the Antarctica from the worst effects of climate change and all the other threats that I've mentioned. So. It's been a huge uh, effort in the 200 years since the first sighting of Antarctica. Uh, we've done a great job, and I think the Antarctic uh, Treaty has been a superb uh, success. But we must now find ways of leading the world, uh, both with regard to Antarctica and with regard to the Arctic, and indeed with regard to the Himalayas. And I, I welcome the title of the web webinar to include the word Himalayas, which where well, the problems are so very similar. We need to find a way of bringing the world's nations together, realizing the threats that we face, not just from climate change and carbon, but also from plastics, from all the other things that we've described. If we don't come together as a globe, every single nation in the world must come together as a globe. We must combat these things. And if we do that, we will preserve the global oceans for our children and our grandchildren. So thank you very much indeed.